morning I'd like to bring you a message entitled Four Things God Did on the Day of Pentecost. And I'll give you those in advance. First, God gave them the ability to speak in known languages that they had never learned. Secondly, God gave the church a baptism of power. Thirdly, God authenticated the church as a divine institution. And fourthly, He gave a bountiful feast of ingathering typified by the Old Testament Pentecost. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 29, 49 rather, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now here is a promise from the Father. And Jesus is going to fulfill that promise on the day of Pentecost. And what is the promise? It is a promise of power. He said, tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. And He said, I send the promise of My Father upon you. Now He couples the promise of the Father with the endowment of power from on high. And so what is the promise of the Father? It is the endowment of power. And certainly we need the power of God. If we are going to minister, if we are going to serve the Lord, we must do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. As Paul said otherwise, my words are tinkling brass and tinkling cymbal and sounding brass. In other words, if you have no power in your life, if the Holy Spirit does not empower you to preach the Gospel or to witness to the lost, then your words will just fall to the ground. But if there is power, then those words will take effect and God will empower them in such a way that people will be saved. And so we need the power of God. And that's what was given on the day of Pentecost. Now Luke adds to that that they would be baptized with, and the Greek preposition here is in, E-N, and we spell it I-N, but it's a little Greek preposition. And our King James Version has the word with, with the Holy Spirit. But actually the Greek word, and it is a preposition, and in the Greek it is in, E-N. So we could read it, be endued with power from on high, and be baptized with or in the Holy Spirit. Now Luke recounts this promise of the Father in chapter 1 of the book of Acts in verses 3 through 5. Notice what he says about it. Now he's writing to Theophilus. And of course, he's speaking about the assembling of the church on that day. Acts 1 verse 3. To whom he showed himself alive after his passion, that is his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now verse 4, and being assembled together with them, now that's a word that's used of the church, assembled together. The church was assembled together on the day of Pentecost. And He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, Ye have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with or in water, but ye shall be baptized with or in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now we know it was ten days later that the Spirit of God fell upon the church on the day of Pentecost. Now first I'd like to mention some things that Pentecost was not. First of all, it was not the beginning of the church. I know that most commentaries and most preachers today are preaching that Pentecost was the beginning of the church. 
and they're referring to the invisible universal church which we do not believe even exists. The church was already in existence on the day of Pentecost. Because if you look at the latter part of Acts 2.47, it says the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. And those were saved on the day of Pentecost. And it was to an already existing church that the Spirit of God fell that day upon that assembly of 120 members of the first church of Jerusalem. So it was not the formation or the beginning of a church. The church was already in existence. Secondly, it was not a new dispensation. If you read Mark chapter 1 through 4, you'll find that the new dispensation began with John the Baptist. Uh, not on the day of Pentecost. And it, it's very clear for you to read that. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. So it was not a new dispensation. Thirdly, it was not regeneration. When the Holy Spirit fell upon that group, they were already saved. They were the 120 that had gathered together there to pray and to wait for the promise of the Father. They were already born again saved people. And so it was not regeneration. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not regeneration. I know that most people teach that it is. But I, my Bible doesn't teach me that. There was no regeneration there except later when those people, 3,000, were saved. They were regenerated, but these people were already regenerated, already born again. They knew the Lord. So... The baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was not regeneration. Now the invisible universal church people have to make that regeneration and they have to make that the beginning of a new church in order to make their doctrine of a universal invisible church uh, stand up. But it won't stand up, in my opinion. It just won't. And then thirdly, it was not prayed down. They did pray, but Pentecost would have come had they not prayed because it was on God's clock, it was on God's timetable, it was on God's calendar, and the day of Pentecost would have come whether they prayed or not. So they did not pray down Pentecost as some people say. We need to get together, they say, and pray down a Pentecost. Pentecost cannot be prayed down. It was on God's timetable and He sent it on the day that He intended for it to come as He had prophesied. Pentecost was 50 days after and so it was prophesied to come. Now, here are some things that I've discovered in looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and baptized that church with His mighty power. But first of all, in Matthew 3.11, John, uh, John said, I indeed baptize you unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, that's Jesus, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you, that is immerse you, in the Holy Ghost and with fire. For one thing, the term as such is not found in Scripture. The term baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is so much used and so greatly abused, but it is not in the Word of God. The only reference is to the prophecy of John the Baptist concerning the ministry of Christ. Is any mention made in the Gospel or the Acts to a baptism by the Holy Spirit? You won't find it. It's not there. After reading Matthew 3.11, the prophecy of John the Baptist, one would expect page after page of description of this marvelous experience in the four Gospels. But you can look till you're as old as Methuselah and you won't find it in the four Gospels. It is not there. And people assume that it is, but it is not. And then again, 
after reading Acts 5 and 11, Acts 11, 16, one would expect to read page after page of discussion on the baptism by the Holy Spirit. Again, it is never referred to by name. It is never mentioned as such. In fact, the word baptize in reference to the Spirit is never used in recounting the story of Pentecost or of Samaria or of Caesarea or of Ephesus or of anywhere else. You can just check that out. And you won't find it. It's not there. When he speaks about Samaria, Caesarea, Ephesus, no mention of baptism by the Holy Spirit. What is more astonishing, we are never told or commanded or urged to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've asked people to show me where the Bible says that. Nobody has ever yet shown me where we're invited or inclined or asked to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible just does not do that. When we seek Scripture truth concerning any such baptism of the Holy Spirit, we cannot find it in the Gospels. We cannot find it in the book of Acts except for John's prophecy. In Matthew 3.11, Acts 1.5 and 11.16, those are the three passages presenting the prophecy of John the Baptist. And there we learn that unmistakably Jesus is the baptizer. Not the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer. John said, He whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlace, He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So the baptizer is Jesus. Never is the Holy Spirit said to baptize anyone. Jesus is the baptizer. The Holy Spirit is the element into which Jesus baptized. Yet they turned it around backwards. They've made the Holy Spirit the baptizer and they have made Jesus the element. So they've got it backward. What happened at Pentecost? What did these disciples experience on that 50th day? The word baptize is never used at Pentecost. You read it there, it, the word baptize is not there. You do find the word filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But the word baptized is not there. I used to think it was. Until somebody called my attention to the fact. And I looked for myself and sure enough they were right. It is not. The word baptized is not there. So what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Lord baptized His church in the Holy Spirit. He put the church in the Holy Spirit and in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit baptism is not regeneration. It is not salvation. Now, the first thing that God did, not necessarily in chronological order, but in my notes, the first thing is that He allowed them the ability to speak in known languages which they had never learned. It was not an unknown tongue. The word unknown is not in the Bible. It's put in there by the translators. It was a known tongue. And let me read to you Acts chapter 2 to show you that the gift they received on the day of Pentecost when they spake in tongues, which means languages, the word is glossa, simply means languages. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, that's languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now I want you to notice closely as I start with verse 6. This is the day of Pentecost. Peter stands up and begins to preach to the crowd 
And notice what it says in verses 6 through 11. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Not an unknown tongue. His own language. Whatever language he spoke, that's what he heard. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? All of these preachers here on the day of Pentecost are Galileans. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, in our own language? This was not some jibber-jabber. They were speaking the known language of these people. Now look at verse 9. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya and Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Greeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, in our languages, the wonderful works of God. <clears throat> now, let's say that there was a, a Mede there, or a Parthian. And what would the Mede or the Parthian hear? These Galileans were speaking the Mede language, or the Parthian language. And they heard in the Mede or the Parthian language. And God has taken pains to make this abundantly clear here that the word tongues is glossa in the Greek and it means languages. It's not an unknown tongue. They were speaking languages they had never learned. It was a divine gift that came to them on the day of Pentecost and they were able to speak these languages of all these foreign countries which they had never learned. And that's the true meaning of tongues. Now, we have brethren that believe today that the gift of an unknown tongue is still in evidence in the church. But we do not believe that. Mm. And I believe this proves that tongues was a language, a known language, and all these people there from different countries heard in their own language. That's the first thing. They were given the gift of languages that they had never learned. The second thing God did on the day of Pentecost was that He bestowed the power of the Spirit of God upon a powerless church. Do you remember how powerless they were? Uh, they came down from the mountain top and here was a, a, a boy uh, that had an affliction and the father brought the, the boy to the disciples to be healed and they couldn't do a thing for him. They didn't have the gift of divine healing, did they? Couldn't do anything for him. They were powerless. And then Jesus healed the boy. They couldn't do it. And they were afraid. You know, Peter was a coward until the day of Pentecost. He was afraid to confess Christ. He three times denied Christ to a little maid as he stood by the fire. They were cowardly. They had no power. They had no understanding much at all. They didn't understand the things Jesus taught them. He said, why are you without understanding? And they just, they just didn't get it. They didn't have the power. And they didn't have the courage. They didn't have the bravado to stand up and boldly preach Christ. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, was poured out upon the church. Then Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, Ye men of Israel, ye have taken of my wicked hands, have slain the Lord of glory. And he just pressed upon them their guilt and their obligation to repent and the awful thing that they had done in crucifying the Lord of glory. There was no fear in Peter's heart that day. Why? The Holy Spirit had come upon him at Pentecost 
And that made all the difference in the world. And He does make all the difference in the world. He is the difference between courage and fear. He's the difference between power and powerlessness. He makes that difference. Old Vance Havner, a quaint preacher, said on one occasion, he said, Lord, give us tonight what we don't have without you. The power. He needed the power to preach. I need the power to preach. You need the power to witness and preach. We need the power. And now on that day, God gave His power to the early church. He said in Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto Me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Spirit is the empowerment of the church. Let me just point out something about the book of Acts and the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit bestows power. Forty-three times in the book of Acts, we read of the powerlessness of the church and then the power of the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 2.4, the Holy Spirit gives utterance. In Acts 4.29, the Holy Spirit inspires boldness. In Acts 5, the Holy Spirit requires purity. And in Acts 5.22, the Holy Spirit cooperates with the witnesses. In Acts 6, He directs organization. In Acts 8, He orders expansion. In Acts 10, the Holy Spirit breaks down barriers. In Acts 13, He overcomes satanic power. And in Acts 16, He directs the witness. In Acts 16 again, He prepares hearts. In Acts 19, He enlightens believers. In Acts 19 again, He confounds mimicry. And in Acts 27, He gives discernment. The Holy Spirit is the empowerment of the church and of the Christian as He serves the Lord. There is a third thing that God did on the day of Pentecost and that was He authenticated His church as God's institution. Now remember that Judaism was coming to a close. The new dispensation had already started. But these Jews, as the Bible says, require a sign. And they got a sign on the day of Pentecost. The coming of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father being fulfilled. And as Judaism was coming to a close, God needed to show these Jews the power and to authenticate the church to take the place of the Jewish temples. And that was necessary. You see, the Jewish people were going to temples. And now the temple worship was over. The church is to take the place of the temples. Christianity is to take the place of Judaism. And the day of Pentecost made that a sharp contrast and it was a sign to the Jews. So on that day God authenticated, credentialed, accredited His church as being a divine institution. That is one of the reasons of the day of Pentecost. The first house of God was the tabernacle. You remember as Moses led them out of Egypt, led them through the wilderness, he erected a tabernacle. And it was called the house of God. And God's presence came down. And there he said, I will meet with thee. In Exodus 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. This is a tabernacle. That I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee, so shall you make it. Now the purpose of the tabernacle, it was to be a sanctuary, a holy place where God would meet with His people. And that's what the church is. It was a sanctuary, a place for God to meet with His people. And so it was a credential place. It wasn't very good to look about. It wasn't very beautiful. Old skins covered the top of it. 
badger skins, seal skins, and various skins. And it was nothing of beauty. There was no beauty in it to be desired. Like Jesus, it says there was no beauty in Him that they should desire Him because the tabernacle was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. No beauty in the tabernacle, but it was God's house. And it was the only house Israel had as they marched through the wilderness. And it was there God would meet with Aaron the high priest. And then, that gave place to the tabernacle, to the uh, temple. In Exodus 40, and he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This old ugly tent, the house of God was filled with the glory of God because it was God's house. And God's house should be filled with the glory of God. And then that tabernacle gives way to another house of God. The second house of God is the temple of God. The temple that Solomon built. An ornate, beautiful thing. And at the dedication of the temple, Again, the Shekinah glory came down upon the temple when Solomon prayed his dedicatory prayer and when they rejoiced in the greatness of Solomon's temple. And in 1 Kings 8, the Shekinah glory comes down and fills the temple. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now, as the tabernacle was marked out and credentialed and authenticated as God's house, so now the temple of Solomon is credentialed and accredited as God's house. God's ordained institution for that time. And now... There is a third house. And that is what we call the house of God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It is the third house. And that is the house that we serve in and worship in today. I don't mean the building. I mean the congregation. The house of God. And God authenticates the church as He did previously the two houses of God. The final great antitype of fulfillment of the tabernacle and the temple are visibly, unmistakably set apart and credentialed as the only God-ordained institution for this economy. And that's why when I see the cults who start all kinds of religions and call it the house of God, grieves my heart. Because God only has one divine credentialed institution which He calls the house of God. The Bible speaks of how we ought to behave in the house of God, Paul wrote to Timothy. So that is the third thing that God did. He credentialed and authenticated the New Testament church as His house. The place where His glory dwells. And there is a fourth thing that God did. And I read from Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. This was the assembled church. Now, the fourth thing was the bountiful feast of ingathering. In the Old Testament Pentecost, they would always bring the first fruits and offer it to God. And if they had obeyed God, and if they had served God and not worshipped idols, He would have always given them a bountiful harvest. And in rejoicing and joy, they would bring the first fruits 
And they would bring it into the house of God and offer it unto the Lord. And God's glory would fill the house of God. Now, this word Pentecost means 50th. That's what the word means. Pentecost was the third of the great feasts of Israel mentioned in Leviticus 23. A harvest festival was always held 50 days after the Passover. You see, there's a time period here. God operates on a calendar. He operates on a certain schedule 50 days after. That's why I say they didn't pray Pentecost down. It was on God's schedule. It had already been preordained 50 days after Pente after after uh, after the Passover it is already ordained and set up to come. So 50 days after Israel left Egypt, the Passover lamb was slain. The Old Testament, Pentecost, 50 days after they left, the Passover slain, the lamb had been slain, and now they go out into the wilderness. The New Testament, Pentecost, occurs 50 days after Christ rose from the dead. You see, there's a remarkable correspondence between them. The Old Testament Pentecost witnessed the slaying of 3,000 souls. The New Testament Pentecost witnessed the saving of 3,000 souls. There again, there's a correspondence there and a remarkable thing. And so, here is a bountiful feast that God gave them on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved by the grace of God. 3,000 swept into the kingdom of God. Oh, that God would do it again. That God would do it again. Now, we won't ever have another Pentecost. But we could have another outpouring of the power of God. And that's what we would pray for. It was a feast of ingathering. And God graciously gave them 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost. That's the greatest thing that can ever happen to a church is to see people saved. You don't need an ornate building. You don't need a tremendous crowd. What you need is to see people receiving Christ as their Savior. Acts 2.41 Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the, that was in water. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So I believe those are the four things that God did on the day of Pentecost. And I trust that this will be, has been a blessing to you and that uh, if you disagree with me, you still have to love me. I'm your brother. <laughs> Amen? Yes. All right, let's bow together and be dismissed in prayer.